Um, when we go to this table and we look up this value, we're going to get a value of 0 0.71643 cubic meter per kilogram. So now we have everything that we need to plug and shove in this problem. So here we have our boundary work is equal to our pressure mass times specific volume at 0.2 minus specific volume at 0.1. Our pressure is constant at 300 kilopascal. Our mass is 5 kilograms. Our specific volume at 0.2 is going to be the superheated vapor specific volume 0.71643 cubic meter per kilogram. And our specific volume at 0.1 is going to be from our saturated vapor, which is 0 0.60582 cubic meter per kilogram. So when I do this math, I get the answer of 166 kilopascal cubic meter, right? Because my kilograms will cancel. But I've given you the answer to the solution in joules. I would probably ask on the exam, give your answer in kilojoules. So we're going to need to convert from kilopascal to cubic meter. This is a conversion I've been doing all week. It's really easy. One kilojoule is one kilopascal times cubic meter, which means we have 166 kilojoules, roughly, as our answer for problem one. So we use this boundary work equation. We looked up from table A5 our specific volume at 0.1. We looked up from table A6 by comparing our saturated temperature to get our specific volume at 0.2. We plugged it in and we got our the work done by the steam during this process to be 166 kilojoules. So this is the steam. Um, this is kind of how we make electricity. We put in water, we heat it up, we make steam, and then we use this to spin turbines or do whatever. So uh, this is why we're generating energy here. Uh, this work, it doesn't really matter if it's positive or negative because we're not looking at it going in or out of a system. We're just calculating the work done by the steam uh, in this process, in this system. So I don't, for this problem, I don't think if it really matters to be negative or positive. Um, I would probably make it negative because it's work being done uh, from the system to the surroundings, but for this problem, I don't think it really matters to, to be concerned with negative or positive. Okay, so are there any questions about that? Please use the chat or you can ask me to my face. Okay. I actually had a question. Yes, go ahead. Um, could you basically reword that same problem and just say find heat? Like, would you like, is that kind of, would that be viable if you gave us kind of the same thing and said, instead of finding work, you could find heat? Just to be curious if you decided to like ask that on like a, like a exam or something like that. I'm just curious if you could re reword that to ask for heat. And then you would need to use the energy equation. Okay. Uh, but yeah, I think that that I could ask for for that for sure. Uh, okay. In this next example we're doing, in part B, I, I I do ask for heat, as you can see here. So that'll give you kind of practice on doing that. Good question. Okay. Uh, yeah, sure. I'll leave it alone. No problem. I thought it. When I was watching the videos, I thought it was like maybe distracting to hear me talking the whole time, but that's totally fine. I'll leave it on. It might be more distracting to have it all. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's work on problem two. For this one, you don't need your book because I've given you the table here. Uh, I changed problem one late last night and I forgot to include the table, so that's why you didn't have it in the first one. But uh, let's work on problem two. I'll go over it probably at 1220. You have like 22 minutes.
Yeah, the way you can check is table A5 is subject to temperature 179 degrees Celsius. So immediately, 200 degrees, 250 degrees Celsius, you're high. Yeah. Yeah, honestly, a lot of people do that. 
like I'll catch people. Okay, it's 30 megapascal. Okay, so that's three, whatever. Oh, it's like, no, like, try that again. You can always Google, like, how many gallons that you're comfortable with it. But most of the ones that work in here are like 200, 300, whatever kilopascal. And then that's all. I always just like, well, that's point two, point three. And then I go from there. Okay, well, then uh, I'll go over in like 10 more minutes and then we're done. Uh, no, I'm actually going to run to the bathroom really quick because I get a heat. So I'll be right back. So we'll go over in about 10 more minutes. So you have 10 minutes to complete part B.
which means that you have to do that rearrangement that we did before. And if you remember, entropy is equal to internal energy plus pressure times volume. Sorry, I'm just trying to stop. You're fine. All right, so for this problem, we know that we have pressure. We know that we have uh, mass, which is nice. But for some of the problems, right, so we have this in delta U is equal to U minus W. So for this problem, we know that we can solve for work because we have our boundary work equation one and two of pressure times the change in volume. But we know we're at a constant pressure. We know that we have a mass, so we can look up this change in volume. So we can solve for boundary work, which is nice. So for this problem, we can solve for work. We have mass, and we can locate that in the property table, which means the only thing we have like left to find is this two. But for the problem that I did on Wednesday, we didn't know information about uh, pressure and volume. So we we move this out. So in U2 minus U1 is equal to Q plus or minus um, pressure volume two minus volume one. Well, so right now we're still using internal energy, but if if we if we didn't have information on pressure and volume, we have the equation where enthalpy is equal to internal energy plus pressure times volume. So it's a way of hiding these unknown values in a value we can look up from our property table. Um, vice versa. So for this problem we're working right now, we can just look up internal energy. If we need to use enthalpy, we still have to look up internal energy or we still like have some sort of internal energy that's included here. We just hide it behind the Do you have notes from Wednesday? Right. Okay. So we did this whole problem and we didn't have any work occurring. So we could just stick with our initial equation of internal energy and look those up totally easy. But the next problem that we did. No, I did another one on Wednesday where I did kind of a change this into entropy. Here. The next problem that we did, we didn't have any information. We were just told constant pressure, but we didn't have any information about pressure or temperature or anything. So here we converted boundary work into this equation, and then I moved my pressure times volume over to my internal energy, and then I, I formed these into enthalpy. So now I can just look up enthalpy for my property table instead of having to try to figure out where to find pressure and volume. So if you're given a problem where you don't really know volume or you don't know anything about pressure, you just know it's constant. Uh, you can look up your entropy values here, or if you're given a problem that gives you enthalpy, you can use this, or if you're given a problem that's asking for you to find the final enthalpy, you can use it here. Hello, do you mind if I? No, do, do anything that you need to do. Yeah, I'll bet. Right, yeah, I think you had it like directly, directly meant. But you're always going to start with internal energy. So until you're forced to use enthalpy or you're told in the column statement to use enthalpy, stick with internal energy. We don't need it in this problem at all. You're going to stick with internal energy. Uh, I could be wrong about that. I don't know if you're But I'm pretty sure. Okay, well, the, yeah, so there you go. I mean, because inherently they're directly connected, right? If they're directly, they're directly, yeah. Right. They're going to be proportional. 
for the most part. But yeah. a while ago. <laughs> totally good. All right, well, I am going to go over the problem. I'm going to go over it. Okay. Uh, should you automatically convert this to Excel or Pascal? Should I what? Should you convert it to a Excel or Pascal to the same method or just leave it? Um, I would always convert it to the answer that I give you, which is still a tool. But on an exam, I will either ask for the units or I won't care what units are. Okay, so like I got 0 to 2, and I'm trying to figure out what you Okay, yeah, so like I got 0 to 2, and I'm trying to figure out what you For part A? Yeah. Um, I think your math is off somewhere. I just subtracted the difference. Okay, just go ahead and work it out. I'll figure out where I do on that. Okay. Um, okay, so on the chat, it seems like there's a little confusion about work. So when you're actually putting work into an equation, here's where it matters if it's negative or positive. So um, in the first part, right, in the first part, you're just told that determine the work done, but you're not asked anything about the work done by the system on the surroundings, determine anything. This is kind of like what's the absolute value of work done. But for part B, you need to make sure that it that you know if it's negative or positive because it has to go into an equation. So um, I will go over that now and hopefully that'll clear clear that up for the people in the chat. Okay, so I'm gonna go Okay, so for part two, we're told piston cylinder device, which right away gives us a hint that there's some sort of piston moving up and down, which gives us the hint of boundary work. We're told it contains initially three kilograms of steam, 0.3 kilograms of steam, so here's our mass term, at one megapascal and 400 degrees Celsius. Then the steam is cooled down. So we have some initial and final temperature. We're told that at, we're at one megapascal, so we can check table A5. We can see what our saturation temperature is. And it's 179 degrees Celsius. It's also right here at table A6. So that is higher. Uh, 250 and 400 are higher than our saturation temperature. So we know for this whole problem, we're going to be in table A6. For part A, we're going to just determine the work done. For part B, we're going to determine heat transfer. So uh, there's already kind of a nice little schematic that we drew here to model how this piston is working. I would always draw it with like an additional hat here, but that's fine. And uh, we give you the hint that you're only going to need to use table A6. And we know we can confirm that we only need to use table A6 once again by checking the saturation temperature. We're above the saturation temperature all the time. We're always going to be a very hot vapor that is hotter than a saturated vapor, so we are a superheated vapor. Okay, so getting started, one of the main things that we know is our pressure at point one, I'm sorry, our temperature at point one is going to be 400 degrees Celsius. Our temperature at point two is going to be 250 degrees Celsius. We know that we are a superheated vapor the whole time. We know that our mass is going to be 0 0.3 kilograms. Since this is a piston cylinder device that's pretty much closed, we're going to assume that there's no real mass change. Um, so we're going to say that this is our mass for our system, not just our mass at point one. And then we know our pressure at point one is going to be equal to our pressure at point two, which is one megapascal. So for getting started, uh, I would kind of look at what we know about this problem. So we know that we have a piston cylinder device, piston cylinder, which gives us a hint that there's going to be some sort of boundary work occurring at the piston. This is also a closed 
stationary system. Which means that we're not going to have a change in kinetic energy or a change in potential energy. And we know that we are going to be using table A6 because we're a superheated basis. Once again, we're going to use this same nomenclature of if uh, we have heat coming in, it's going to be positive, heat going out is negative, work coming in is positive, work going out is negative. We're going to define this system here and this system here. So this heat going out here is going to be negative. And if we have any work that's going out like this, this is going to be negative as well. All right. So now we kind of have the problem set up. Um, for part A. For part A, we are asked to determine the compression work, meaning the work done by the moving compressing cylinder, piston. Determine compressor work if the final state is one megapascal, which I already listed here, and our final temperature is 250. So for this problem, it's really easy. We already have an equation for work, which is boundary work equation, the integration from point one to point two of our pressure times our change in volume. And our pressure is the same. It's easy. This equation just becomes pressure times our V2 minus V1, which is also pressure times mass times our specific volume at point two minus our specific volume uh, at point one. We know our pressure. We know a mass. We need to look up our specific volumes at point one and point two. We can look these up from table A6 because we're, we already established up here. That's the table we're using the whole time. So our specific volume at point two is going to be equal to our specific volume at uh, 250 degrees Celsius and 1000 kilopascals. So this specific volume is going to be uh, 0 0.23275 cubic meter per kilogram. And our specific volume at point one is going to be at 400 degrees Celsius and 1000 kilopascal. So this specific volume is going to be 0 0.30661 cubic meter per kilogram. So now we have everything we need to plug it and check it. So we have 1000 kilopascal times 0 0.3, 0 0.3 kilograms times uh, 0 0.23275 minus 0 0.30661 cubic meter per kilogram. We're going to have kilograms cancel. We're going to get kilopascal cubic meter. Working this out, our answer is going to be 22 kilopascal cubic meter. I'm going to multiply this by a kilojoule uh, unit conversion. So one kilojoule is one kilopascal cubic meter which gives me 22 kilojoules. This is the amount of compressive work done. The way that we have defined our system, I would say that this work is negative. The book, the book is a lot less strict about this when it comes to just asking for work. So for them, when they're asking for the work done, they're really asking for like this absolute value of the work. They don't need information about direction. They're kind of, they already, it's assumed that it's already kind of known the direction and it's saying, okay, what's the work done by the seam, whatever. So you don't need to include direction all the time here. For this class, I would always encourage you to do that, but um, I'm warning you that the book is kind of loose with this. 
So I would say that the answer is actually negative 22 kilograms, kilojoules. If you just put 22, um, I think that's okay for, for these problems and, and for an exam, um, because you're going to have to make some sort of inference for part B. So you have to know that this is actually negative for part B. But for part A, if you just put the work done is 22 kilograms, like kilojoule, um, that, I think that's okay. All right. So for part B, we're asked to determine the heat transfer. And that we, I was nice enough to give you the letter Q. So determine the heat transfer. And there's one way that we relate heat and work, and that's through our energy equation. So our change in energy of our system is equal to our energy in minus our energy out. Our change in energy of our system here um, is going to be this change in kinetic energy plus our change in potential energy plus our change in internal energy. And energy in and energy out is going to be heat minus work. So this minus here is arbitrary. It's essentially saying heat plus negative work. You need to make sure that this uh, kind of fits with what you're doing. If you have negative heat here or negative work, you need to change these to fit what you're actually looking at. So, uh, so a lot of what the book does is this is heat in minus work out, but they're really saying that with the labels here. So heat in being Q positive Q, work out being negative W. So if you have heat going out, this should actually be a negative Q. If you have work coming in, this should actually be a positive Q. So make sure that this equation makes sense for what your system is. For our system right now, we have heat that's going uh, out because the steam is cooling, and we have work that's coming out from our system as well. So um, I'm going to keep. I'm going to um, yeah, I was thinking it would be the difference of it instead of adding it to 96 because I was thinking of it, but I see that you have the other way too. I don't think that's what you want to mention. Um, so basically, you know, in our case, um, our work is negative, and our heat is negative as well. Yes. So our heat is negative, and our work is negative as well. If that's the case, the result is one thing. But it gets confusing. So, okay, so for this problem, our heat is negative and our work is negative as well. We don't have kinetic energy, we don't have potential energy, we do have a change in internal energy here. So, uh, for the way that we want to do this problem, um, We are looking at our our change in energy is equal to our our heat, our change in internal energy is equal to our heat and our work. And we want to make sure that for sure this work is negative. Uh, our heat is also going to be negative, and then our change in internal energy is going to be occurring here. The way that the um, the way that we can do this is we're solving for heat, so heat's going to be positive Q is equal to uh, our change in internal energy minus our work here, 
this change in internal energy, even though I'm moving it over here, um, I'm not going to make it negative because it's our change in internal energy. So we don't want our negative change in internal energy. And we know that our Q value here should be negative. So we want to make sure that our answer here is negative. We know that it's going to be negative. We don't necessarily know that up here um, when writing our equation, which is why this equation is always going to be Q equals uh, or no, this equation here. So I'm actually rearranging this equation to get this equation, but we know that we want this Q to be negative. So I would I would not mark it negative up here yet because of the way that the equation is, is kind of written in the book in the way that it works out. But you know that you want this to be negative here. And if we're defining this as T in and work out, then we want this to be negative and this to be positive. Couldn't you just move the work to the other side and then Q would still be negative? Uh, you had it set up initially as negative Q minus W. You could just add W to the other side and then Q would still be negative. Yeah, but then you're adding work to your internal energy and, and you don't want to do that. But isn't that and what your we equation would be? Would be very we end up having to do that for the final answer though, don't we? Huh? Don't we end up having to do that anyway for to get the final answer? Uh, no, you're subtracting that work to get the final answer. Either way, the result will be negative, but the thing is this, whether you add it or subtract it, because either way, it's going to be minus 52 or minus 76. Regardless, it's still negative. Right. Um, yeah, I, I think we're overthinking this because it doesn't really matter. But I am so like anal about negative and positive that we'll just keep going. Um, okay, so, all right, so we have Q is equal to our change in energy of our system, which is going to be our change in internal energy uh, minus our boundary work. And then we have our internal energy here is going to be mass times our change in internal energy specific internal energy. And then our boundary work is from part A that we figured out, but this is going to be our boundary work here. So we know we have mass and we need to look up internal energy from our property table. So our U2 value is going to be our internal energy at 0.2, which is uh, one megapascal and 250 degrees Celsius which gives us 2,710.4 kilojoules per kilogram. And then U1 is going to be at 400 degrees Celsius and one megapascal. So this is 2,957.9 kilojoules per kilogram. So as you can see here, um, we have 2,700 minus 2,900. This delta U value here is already going to be negative. So this is going to be 0 0.3 kilograms times 2710.4 minus 2957.9 kilojoules per kilogram minus our boundary work from problem uh, from part A, which is going to be 22 kilojoules. So this problem, uh, when you solve it out, is going to give you our negative 74.25 minus 22 kilojoules, which is going to be minus 96.25 kilojoules. So the system is losing heat while work is being done on it. So this is losing heat. We already know that because it said the steam is allowed to cool. So, um, this is your answer. Okay.
question that we have. Um, will we always have both work and negative of both positive? Or can we have both negative and be positive at the same time? You can have any combination. So you can have positive heat, negative work, negative heat, negative work, negative heat, positive work. You can have any combination. So in our, in our case, we have work done by the system. That means negative work. Right. And, and we're losing heat. That's negative heat as well. Right. So. That's where I get confused in that, in that because it's it seems somehow would have that seventy three was something since uh, in part it already know it was negative it become like instead of having this addition it would be the subtraction that would give us negative fifty instead of negative ninety six so it's kind of confusing that we put this on. But if we if we if we if we agree on the side, we go with it for the whole problem. We can't like in a change. So I would always start with this equation. That's correct. So I always do heat minus work out, and then eventually they work themselves out. So this is the energy of your system is. Energy in minus energy out. This is why we have a positive Q and a negative work that's assumed here. So I would I would stick with this starting equation and then finish your answer and make sure that this direction makes sense to you. Okay, in part A as well. Um, the answer itself was supposed to be negative because we say two minus one, but we did one minus two. That's why you got positive. You did two minus one two is smaller. I mean the U two is less than the one. Therefore, the result will be negative. We would not even have to assume it's negative. It would have been negative. Oh, you're right. Yeah, I did. I did switch those in, in the last problem. I switched the volumes in the last problem. So yeah, this value. So in the last problem, this value should be negative. As you can see, the negative and positive get really confusing. So I would say, like from you know from system to surroundings. So just like tell me how you can find it. Yeah. Okay. Put it that way. I'm losing negative. I'm getting it positive. I kind of yeah. tell my mind that. Honestly, if you put the wrong sign, you're probably gonna lose like three points. So as long as you're getting these step by step and you're kind of understanding what you're doing, you know, just try to make a note of how you're defining your system. Double check that it makes sense. It's, it's not a huge deal. Okay. So any questions about anything? Okay. Well then, everybody have a great weekend. Um, enjoy your. Uh, Days off your Saturday, and I will see you all on Monday. I know, Marshall. Pretty sure that's what the silver.